Happy Friday, everyone. Woo! Woo! <laughs> All right, so welcome to today's fireside chat all about website accessibility and compliance. Um, with us today, we have our web developer here at Aim Clear, Sarah Solinsky, oh, and, our woo, and our graphics designer, Brittany Dubina. Woo! And then woo! I always forget myself, so we're going to do it today. <laughs> I'm Lena Scudamore. I'm the CEO, and I am certified in WCAG, which is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Woo! So. <laughs> when we get into this, one of my favorite quotes is from Sean Lawton Henry at the W3C. Um, and her quote is, people are not disabled. It's bad design around them that is disabling. And I think true. we all, <laughs> it's very, very true. Yeah. So what we're going to be talking about today is web accessibility from a dev, a design, and an SEO perspective. But before we get going, see if I can share my screen without breaking anything. We have a question and we're pulling the audience. So please answer. How often do you or your team consider ADA accessibility for websites when creating new content? A, I always top of mind nearly 100% of the time. B, most of the time, up to 75% of the time. Some of the time, up to 50%. And then what is ADA accessibility for websites? So Sarah, why don't you kick us off? What do you think? Well, uh... Personally, I just, I know there's always room for improvement. I would say I, I would, I would say probably be 70, 75% of the time. And like, just especially when I'm working in things that are like hot button, like easily not accessible things, you know, just whatever we're discussing today, I know I, I keep it front of mind. Perfect. And Brittany? I would echo Sarah if I was being honest as well. Um, but honestly, before we, I even knew about this, I'd probably fall under D. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Yeah. I think that's probably fair. Um, so I would probably go into the B range too, into that 75%. Um, but always looking to improve. And I think we're getting closer as a team to that 100% line. We're getting there. We're, that's, our, that's our goal, right? And I think we'll always be working towards that goal. So what is web accessibility? What it is, is making sure that your website or web content works for everybody and is accessible for everybody with all abilities. What the WCAG is, or W-C-A-G, or WCAG, or for short, just CAG, because it sounds a lot prettier. <laughs> um, but for more, more than 20 years, the World Wide Web Consortium, or the W3C, has provided web content accessibility guidelines, the WCAG, as recommendations for web developers and designers like us to encourage, encourage utilization of a set of standards and practices to best accommodate web users of varying abilities and diverse technologies. So there's three real reasons we worry about CAG and accessibility and making sure things are good to go. Number one is people. Number two is money. And number three is lawsuits, which equals more money. Um, <laughs> but, let's, <laughs> but let's just quick dive into people because 20% of Americans have an ability that affects the way they use the web. Let's just let that sink in. That's like one in five. So we these abilities range from things that are like lifting and gripping and difficulty holding things like our happy little mobile devices, um, vision difficulty, hearing difficulty, complete hearing loss. And then also we have to remember that we're when we're developing content that our population in the US as a whole is getting much older with our baby boomers. So we want to make sure that we're continually making things easier for people. Yeah, and the second reason we care is money. Money, money, money. money. If you if you knew 20% of your site users weren't able to use your site, wouldn't you want to fix it? That's 20% of the contact, 20% of the people trying to check out at your website. Yeah, might even be down the door. Yeah, if your site is not accessible for those users, that's money walking out the door. So that is why we care. Right. And finally, lawsuits. We don't like those and we don't want them. And unfortunately, statistics state that a new lawsuit is filed every hour of the work because of website accessibility. So in short, federal laws like Title III of the American with Disabilities Act and its sister, the Rehabilitation Act, require businesses and government agencies to ensure 
Online content is free of barriers that would make it difficult or impossible for people with disabilities to make use of them. Right. Yeah, the regulations of those laws say that WCAG 2.0 success criteria is the standard for both web and non-web electronic content. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we all work on our perception and like get to developers and designers and SEOs and content creators on the same page and start talking about accessibility and thinking about people before we start thinking about processes. And in our line of work, we really like those checklists. <laughs> we love checklists. But the thing is, is there isn't a checklist out there that's going to work 100% for everybody. And if you planned it so like 100% of the time it works perfect for a Braille user, a Braille display user, it's going to make it completely inaccessible for another type of assistive, assistive technology. <sighs> Words today. So if we had to make a list of tips, though, I think we can make that. So you guys jump in when you got stuff. But I'm going to start mine off with write web accessibility statement. Make sure it includes plain English. It isn't legalese. has to be short sentences that make sense. And tell the users where your site's at, where you're hoping to go, and if they run into a problem, an email address of where they can contact somebody to get help. That's super important. We also want to make sure that your content isn't so large that it's a resource hog and it's bogging down mobile devices that may be in a low coverage area because that is limiting their access to information and you need to make sure that that is not happening. So that's another one. I think the biggest thing we'd all agree on is uh, testing, WCAG testing and checks. So Britt, why don't you jump in and tell us your must do checks? Sure. Um, make sure you're implementing sufficient color contrast. If you were to look at your site today, right now, chances are you're going to find contrast issues on at least one page of your site. When color pairings are used without enough contrast, text can be difficult or impossible for users with low vision or color vision deficiency to read. So even if you have no vision deficiency, trying to read light yellow text on a white background isn't the easiest, right? <laughs> no, it's right. horrible. So the only sustainable way to fix a contrast accessibility issue is to test it out. Change the size of your text, change the color of your text, or change the color of the background. But just remember the magic number of 4.5 to 1. That's the minimal contrast ratio requirement. And then right. also design visually a clear structure. Make it easy for a user to distinguish sections on a site, such as your navigation menus, your links, your text sections, etc. Reduce that clutter, utilize that white space, and make it easier for a user to scan it and understand it. Perfect. Even within that, provide distinct styles for interactive elements, such as your links and your buttons to make them easy to identify. From a visual perspective, links are often colored and underlined. And buttons are identified by shape. So you want to make sure those stylings are also used consistently throughout your site. And then another thing is to make sure we ensure the navigation across pages within a website that has consistent meaning, styling, and positioning. Because if it is inconsistent, it can be particularly disruptive for those who are using screen readers and such. But with more on that, Sarah, why don't you take us into the weeds? <laughs> That's right. Strap your boots on. We're getting into some code. <laughs> this is where I always get scared. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. It's my happy place. <laughs> That's why we have you. Yes. Yeah. So speaking of navigation, as Brittany was talking about, if your assistive technologies can't navigate through your website, then it's bust. You know, the user right. will walk out the door. They can't navigate. So the very first thing I would do would be to open your website right now, go put your cursor in the address field and start pressing tab. See where the cursor goes, see how it navigates. Does it make sense? Is that where you want it to go? Mm -hmm. That's important. Super important. There are many users with motor, motor disabilities who rely on a keyboard. Blind users also typically use a keyboard for navigation. Those with lack of fine motor skills, birth defect, amputation, there are many, many, many reasons the keyboard works better than a mouse for a user. Yeah. So some users may use modified keyboards or even uh, hardware that mimics the functionality of a keyboard. So it's still that keyboard navigation that is important. Um, 
So one thing that as a developer, I need to know about, I need to know about tab index. It's a global attribute that you can apply to most HTML elements. And it controls two things. It controls if a element is focusable or it can turn a non-interactive element into an interactive element. Um, and then it also controls at what point is it focusable and it can take things out of the, the it's called the, the tab index of so the tab order. It can take things out of the tab order, which is very important if like say on a smaller screen side size, maybe you're hiding some content. Well, you don't want that to be interactive anymore. <laughs> right. How, right. Like, how many times have you tabbed through things and suddenly you don't know where the tab cursor is? It's lo and behold, it's on some hidden modal somewhere. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Right. So yeah, you, you need to be able to take things out of the tab order. Um, Z, so when you write this in your code, you, you know, you're doing tab index equals and then a number negative numbers take it out of the tab index uh the tab order zero is the default position which is best if you're adding something to the tab order you use zero you can also do a positive number which would like change where in the order it shows up the yeah. first place your cursor will go is to a positive number if there are any on your page and then go through them one and going upward uh this is not considered the best practice but it's doable Sometimes we need to do fancy things and make things fancy. not normal, <laughs> <laughs> not default. But so then to, to add or to add to that, yeah, I, uh, my second check would just generally be endorsing good syntax, good HTML syntax. Uh, all ex assistive technology is built around HTML syntax. So if you're writing good code, you're most of the way there. Um, you need good semantics on your website, like Brittany was mentioning, good intuitive web pages. Uh, this all translates to the accessibility tree, which is how assistive technologies are interpreting your web page. Like our lovely uh, visual here, the accessibility tree, it interprets the DOM, your page, um, and the accessibility tree it stores data for every element it stores role name state and value most elements probably do not have state and value uh, but they will have a role and a name for sure um, and then the accessibility tree hands that information off to assistive technology like a screen reader and that's kind of what what the screen reader is reading as it goes down the page um, and so if you're doing like real kind of real fancy, fan, some fancy development, making <laughs> things interesting that are not just intuitive, uh, HTML, whatever, you're making a div into a checkbox or something like that. You, you do need to tell the accessibility tree what the role is of that div or, or the name, which brings me to Aria. ARIA is how we do that. <laughs> it's how we want to round out our really well-written code into the best it can be for those assistive technologies. It doesn't change the DOM. It doesn't change behaviors on your page. Sure. It just allows you to edit the accessibility tree, hmm. which is important. Yeah. Because then we are telling the screen reader or what have you what is happening on the page. So um, we're making the fancy things work accessibly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. Uh, it's a set of attributes that define the ways, uh, define ways to make web content and web applications, especially those developed with JavaScript, more accessible to people with disabilities. So a few examples just uh, to help you understand what I mean. Like I mentioned before, maybe you're making a super fancy form <laughs> and there's some real cool design elements to it that just they're not standard GUI for the right. browser. But we know. love fancy cool things. We yeah. do. We want them to look pretty. So pretty. I, yeah. I love I love them too. And like that's my favorite part of being a developer is making yeah. them neat things. And Brittany and I design design super cool stuff. And you have, you really have. 
It just means that like the standard HTML, which right. normally would tell the accessibility tree standard things, it it means that we're using it for something it's not meant for, maybe like a div that we're making into a checkbox for some reason. It's all right, it happens. <laughs> so we we make everything special and cool. Well, we then we need to tell the accessibility tree what it is because that div is just a simple grouping element to the, the accessibility tree. So we need to tell it the role, which in this case might be checkbox. It's a checkbox now. Perfect. Um, and it tells the access, uh, this system technology how to interact with it better. Um, and let's see, the other cool example, or just really important example, is like, you know, say your form submits and it has an error uh and you know your error pops up at the top of the page and and a, a sighted user would see it it's big and red great well someone using a screen reader still needs to know that's there and my cat came to visit <laughs> hello cat <laughs> <laughs> right and yeah yeah so just to say that there is a specific role in aria called alert that will immediately uh, be read when that role happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so the screen reader re reads it right away, then your non-sighted user is on the same page as a sighted user. And that's really important. And you need to make it explicit. Tell this, tell Aria what the error is and it'll be read right away. It's great, it's useful. This is why we need Aria. <laughs> right, it sounds like it's really important and also super helpful. Um, one of the things, yes. my favorite thing when it comes to like those sort of things with errors are the errors don't tell me what it is. So like today when I was trying to order my lunch, I had all these errors and I couldn't figure it out. And I had to go through each cell in the form to figure out which one I messed up. And it was how they wanted the expiration date for my credit card. They wanted instead of the four digit, what I use, they wanted the, the, the six digits, the month and the full year. Ah. And I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, I don't know which one, which one's wrong. I just want a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> it was lunchtime. It was time to do this. They had kids and the whole thing. So those forms needing to have that information is super important too. To like, it's not just like error 165241, but um, it's, uh, it's actually, <laughs> just kidding. But it's actually something that is legible and usable for everybody. Um, some of my other checks when we're going through our, our list of things we need to make, keep an eye on. Is check out video and audio files make sure they have transcripts and captions um we want to make sure that any forms have that are tabable and then also that the labels don't disappear like the label on my order form for my sandwich today when i was trying to type it in as soon as i started to type it disappeared and i didn't catch that i needed to do a different format so sarah do you want to talk to us about some of those other things you and i've been working on with forms yeah forms are probably one of the number one ways that our users interact with our web pages. You know, right. there's there's a newsletter subscription, there's a search bar, there's contact forms. If right. you're e-commerce, e you know, your entire checkout system is a series of forms usually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's obviously important that they work. Uh, like we said earlier, money is, money is walking out the door if they're not working. Right. So. Yeah. One of the easiest ways that I see these things broken is uh, labels that, as Leah was saying, we take away the labels because yeah. uh, we, we as an industry, we love our really minimal, clean designs. It's just a series of boxes, no extra words. Right, it's just so fresh and so clean. Uh, <laughs> it's true, like it looks so nice. It does. But, but does it work so nice? Not always, not always. Sometimes you just can't get to the sandwich. <laughs> yeah, so there are good ways to do this, make minimal design forms. You just have to be conscientious that you have to do it accessibly. There's an accessible way to hide the visual word of the label. You can, you can basically tell it not to be there visually, but still be there, and the screen reader will still read it then, which is good. We want that. The other thing that we love to do um, is we love to uh, make the the word in the box, the placeholder, the word in the box, we love to make it like a really light gray on a white background. It's just not very legible. Like 
like Brittany was talking about earlier, we need to make things a good color contrast to be accessible. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to pause the, it right there because we have a quick jump in. Is that okay? Of course. Yeah. Okay. So we got Kristen. She's asking, can you rely on YouTube to, for the transcripts and captions on videos? And so this kind of goes back a second, but what I want to, you can use it to get you started, but you do need to go through and edit it. You need to make sure that when you're, if Sarah's talking, you say Sarah's talking, if Brittany's talking, Brittany's talking, uh, and make sure you are make, checking how it times out. Uh, YouTube has a lot of tools or a lot of um, information where you can find that information. So it would be a good place to do it there. Um, then we've got Bethany saying transcription to video is federal law now to the ADA compliance. You may have answered that already. If you do catch the beginning of the video later. <laughs> yeah, we did talk about that. It is part of the stuff that you have to do. And as a team, we've actually been having discussions and making sure that we're doing this because it is part of that now. So yeah, great comments and questions. Sarah, back to you. Hello. <laughs> yeah. To just, I had a few more notes on on making forms uh, accessible. It's it's good to use grouping elements like field sets and legends. The just the more intuitive and the more semantics you can layer in your page, the better. Right. The more the assistive technology knows what's happening and allows the user to to have a good idea of what is happening. That's important. Very important. Who's, who, who's filling out a form that they don't know why? Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So more extra, more instructions, more explicit. Make your validation explicit. Um, right. And also, when you have really long forms, uh, it's good to make them multi-page forms. It allows the user to kind of take a breath, uh, feel like they can concentrate on what's in front of them, not be overwhelmed. That's really important. And with forms too, we want to make sure that we are, if we're setting time limits, we make it a, the time limit available to people to extend because some people need a little more time to complete each step. So I understand that there are some industries where time is important. It's just that you also should have the option to stop or pause that timer so that people can do what they need to do. Um, so besides forms, some other tips of things you wanna make sure you're thinking about when you're working on accessibility for your website and other web properties, PDFs are Brittany's favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> PDFs, working with Brittany on PDFs is one of our favorite things because things can, because the layout and the way you were, the readers go through them can get messed up quite easily. So making sure read order lines up with what they're seeing on the page, making sure images are, have their alt text and things like that. That's all really important with a PDF. Uh, from web website perspective, I'm going to sound like an SEO right now. <laughs> Shocker. Um, <laughs> But meta titles and meta descriptions are just important, as important for those uh, Braille display users, those uh, the screen readers and other assistive technologies, because that's how they also choose which SERP they're going to click on. So making sure meta titles, meta descriptions are done and that they are clear. Headlines are in the appropriate order. H1s are used as titles of the page instead of just because you want one sentence really big font at the, halfway through the page. That's not what they're for. They're not pretty fonts. It's actually the hierarchy, just like a table of content. Your uh, H1 is the top title. H2 is your subtitles. H3 are the sub subtitles and so on. So you want to make sure those are in the appropriate order because those users of assistive technology do have the ability to skip through headlines to figure out what part of the information they want to read. They might not want to read the whole article. They found this part in the SERP and they want to read that part. So they're skipping to the right headline to get them to where they want to learn the information. So then alt text on your images. If the image doesn't need alt text because it doesn't, it's just for decoration, make sure that null's in there. Um, and then just listen to your SEOs. Make sure that you're investing in that and you're taking the time to do that because in the end of the day, um, that stuff SEOs have been talking about all relates to user experience and accessibility. So with that, that's kind of our list is in a nutshell. We're going to give some of our favorite tools. So I'm going to let Sarah start. Yeah. Um, we're not magicians. We don't, we don't magically know everything. So obviously we are using some, a good variety of tools to investigate accessibility. Um, 
One of my favorites is a Chrome extension called Accessibility Insights for Web. Uh, it's, it's just a nice quick overview, uh, just done in a flash and you can, you know, click on all the issues it lists and it highlights in the, in the web page. That's really nice and easy. So then I can go investigate, see what the issue is. Uh, the other thing I use, I mean, I use religiously in all parts of my job <laughs> is Chrome dev tools. It's the built-in dev tools, uh, the built-in inspector in Chrome. It has a really nice accessibility menu. Um, it, it shows you the accessibility tree. It shows you all ARIA attributes being used. Um, Mozilla also has a very similar thing as well. So cool. being, being able to inspect the accessibility tree is really important. Sure, and Brett, how about you? My favorite tool is Contrast Checker. Awesome. One, because it's super easy to access because it's literally called contrastchecker.com. You enter in your two little hex codes and then right below there, it kind of shows out where those two colors lie in the, um, lie within compliance. Awesome. So I have a couple tools that I really like. One of them is Chrome extension that's for, it's Wave, the Wave Chrome extension. Um, I like that one when talking to a client and screen sharing because it highlights things in red and you can actually click on it, a tab, and it takes them to the code. So you can, if you want to get that deep with them, you can. Otherwise, it makes it really easy for me to say, Sarah, it says it broke here. <laughs> I, do that. I do that quite often. Sarah, it says it broke here <laughs> if I can't fix it on my, on my own. Um, the other one is, is there's a second web developer extension for Chrome. It's different from the one that Sarah recommended. It has a little gray cog icon. That one's super helpful because you can strip down a website to its bones and you can get rid of the CSS, take out images and get the linear lineup of the page. So where do those headlines land? Where's the text? Where's a picture in relation to it? So that you know that when somebody's using a reader, it goes right through and reads it for you and you can see it as a roadmap. Um, so that's really cool. Yes. Okay. I love, I love that one. It's I so powerful. Too. There's it's, it's really fun to play around with because there's so many options in it and like, I love it. Go yeah, you, look for the web developer extension for Chrome. Yeah. You can really take apart a website really quick to see what you need to work on. Um, sometimes you're kind of like, Ooh, <laughs> sometimes you're like, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's really cool. The other one, Oh, what's a cog? A cog is a gear, a little gear. <laughs> so like, you know, it, it's like the settings icon for a lot of things. Yeah, cog or yeah, the gear. Um, the other one that I use a lot and when we do our trainings, we do a weekly training as a team here at Aim Clear. It starts with our CTO through our VP of creative, through our VP of product innovation. The whole team gets together. If somebody's gone, we record it, but we go through a section of the W3C's website. So specifically in the W3C.org forward slash WAI, which stands for Web Accessibility Initiative. That website, we go through, we pick a section and we take it apart. Sometimes we'll each divide up a section and like Brittany has gone through and done design and contrast and things we need to talk, think about like buffers and stuff. Um, we go through that site and pull it apart and make decisions as a team as how we're gonna handle each piece which has been super helpful and I like it a lot. I don't know if you guys like it as much as I do, <laughs> but, but I know we should, of course. We can, of course, oh, of course. Real quick, she was asking, what is the name of it? It's oh. called, it's, it's just called Web Developer. It's a dumb name <laughs> because it's really generic. It's really but, hard. <laughs> yeah, there's but, Yes, search Web Developer Chrome extension and it's the little gray cog. That's all we got. That's all I got. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm looking to see if anybody answered our poll for our ABCD. Doesn't look like on the chats that I can see when I'm scrolling really quick. However, I did the poll online to some other SEOs. And the split was really kind of, it was interesting to me. A lot of people fell in camp B and C. So let me see if I can pull up that image one more time. Please hold. <laughs> Cue elevator music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Go team. That was that was for 
our VP of creative. He loves it when I say hashtag go team. All right. So back to the poll. We had um, we don't don't have a lot of answers in our feed here, but when I pulled online before, most people fell in camp B and C. So most of the time up to 75% of the time and some of the time with 50%. There were only three people that admitted to D. Um, and then there were uh, three people out of like, there were 27 people that commented over a couple hours time. Um, but most people were in the B to C and just three up in the A's and three down in the D's. So overall, I think everybody's kind of in that spot where everybody's learning and trying to move to the next right. thing. So I'm gonna try to summarize everything we talked about. <laughs> and I'm not gonna do it in one breath, though that would be a challenge. All right, ready? <laughs> Watch as like choke or something. All right. So first we want to make sure that we are making content content that is accessible for people. We want to consider color contrast, font sizes, spacing, consistency of navigation. We want to test, test, test navigation by tabbing through our own websites and completing purchases, contact us forms, etc. We want to dig into ARIA and not be afraid of it and go find those things to help make elements more accessible. We want to ensure error messages are clear and not just numbered or lettered to tell users what to fix. We want to build forms that ensure proper labels, tabbing works, adjustable time limits. You want to listen to your SEO <laughs> and use pro proper meta titles, descriptions, headlines, and alt text. You want to test your PDFs and videos and audio. Make sure you have those transcripts in, um, closed captions there. And then again, listen to your SEOs. Um, if you need a place to get started on aimclear.com, we have a WCAG guide, or you can go to aimclear.com forward slash CAG dash SEO dash Y dash ADA compliance is good for users and SEO, um, but you can get right on our blog. So aimclear.com, go to the blog page. It's right there. Um, so Britt and Sarah, did I miss anything? Just be conscientious. Yeah, our job is... Great. Our job is helping people. Just think exactly. about being conscientious. So don't exactly. be a jackass, right? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. mean, really, do the right thing. Do the right thing. Build stuff that works for everybody or as many people as possible. All right. So before we let you go, we want to uh, invite everybody to come back next Friday, May 29th at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time and hang out with our CTO, Joe Warner, and our creative director, Eric Stafford. They're going to be discussing... Um, how creative, hold on, how creative and tech collaborate for results. So we hope to see you all next Woo. week. Woo. And thank you so much for joining us. And happy Friday, everybody. Hashtag go team. Woo. Thank you, ladies.